Good day, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Employee Benefits Broadcast Conference Call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. If anyone should require assistance during the conference, please press star then zero on your touchtone telephone. I would now like to turn the call over to your host, Greg Duge. Please go ahead. A warm welcome to all of our listening audience for this, our first Employee Benefits Broadcast of 2012. My name is Greg Duge, and I'll be taking care of a few housekeeping and introductory details. First, the housekeeping details. If you require technology assistance, please call 866-493-2825. That's 866-493-2825. If you require audio assistance, dial star zero. If you want to submit a question, use the pull-down Q&A menu. We will answer a few questions at the end of the presentation if there is time. Otherwise, we will attempt to respond to questions via email after the broadcast. Today, we want to take a look at three areas that aren't new in that they're not the product of new legislation or new regulatory developments. However, while the topics aren't new in terms of recent government action, Today's topics involve subjects that, prevent recur that present recurring issues for plan sponsors. First, Belinda Morgan from our Chicago office will discuss a lawyer's view of vendor contracts. In the typical scenario, an employer may have selected a new vendor for one of its self-insured benefit plans, often after an RFP process. The new vendor has been selected, the transition or implementation process is underway, and then, and only then, does the subject of the service agreement or formal contract arise. Coming at a time in the process where the new relationship has already entered the implementation stage, there's a natural desire on the part of many of the participants to simply sign the contract without further discussion. Belinda will discuss what a lawyer sees in these contracts. Second, Isaac Morris of our Milwaukee office will discuss that pesky definition of compensation that appears in your 401k or other benefit plans. For some employers, there may be a disconnect between the definition in the plan document and the compensation that is treated as benefit eligible in practice. Isaac will discuss a few things that we have seen and what to look out for. Finally, I will discuss a few more Section 409A issues that continue to arise. Those of you who have attended the Employee Benefits Broadcast over the past three or so years know that the deferred compensation rules of Section 409A have been a frequent topic of discussion, and with good reason. Section 409A truly represents a sea change in the regulation of non-qualified benefits, and we continue to see instances in which the scope of Section 409A is not yet understood or appreciated. So today, we want to, in a sense, go back to square one and address the core consideration of when Section 409A applies and when it doesn't. With that, I will turn the program over to Belinda Morgan for our first presentation. Thanks, Greg. As Greg mentioned today, I'm going to discuss some of the issues that can arise with respect to your contracts with your employee benefit plan vendors, so your TPAs, your insurance providers, PBMs, and other service providers. Now, our clients, as Greg mentioned, often ask us to review their vendor contracts, but it, it, many times it often seems as though that's not something they really think is necessary. Uh, and generally that's because they've already done their homework before they've come to us. The client's already investigated and picked out a great, highly respected vendor to provide the services that they need. They've met with the vendor's represent, representatives, and they've discussed those needs and have worked out the timing for implementation. The vendors provided them with the contract that lays out the services and products that the vendor is going to provide and the terms under which they'll be provided. So after the client's done all the legwork and the process of securing the vendor is either essentially complete or almost complete, our clients will come to us and ask us to give a con their contracts a quick review and let them know that the contract's okay to sign as is and generally without any sort of negotiation as to the terms. And in that case, what do we do as lawyers? We proceed to review the contract and oftentimes do find issues where negotiation could be helpful, items that might need to be deleted, and in many cases essentially throw a roadblock into the entire process and make the whole smooth path that the client and the vendor has started down just a little bit more rocky. So today I'm going to try to give you an idea first of 
why in light of the headaches that we might cause by the review, and even though it's one of the last steps in the process oftentimes, why attorney contract, a review of your contracts may be really still very important. Um, so today we'll be discussing three general topics. First, again, why does it matter? Uh, why is it important to have an attorney review your contracts and why you don't necessarily just want to sign what the vendor has provided? Uh, two, some of the issues that can go wrong. So issues and problems that what we've seen and what we're oftentimes looking for when we review your contract. Uh, and in that instance, I'll give you some examples of the provisions that we're specifically looking for and some issues that we've seen come up in the past. And thirdly, how can you help to avoid contract problems? Or essentially, what steps can you take to avoid any headaches that might accompany uh, potential contract problems? All right, so first, why does it matter and why is it important to have a review? Uh, in many cases, folks just assume that the main purpose of the vendor contract is to lay out all the terms for the services that will be provided to the client and to give you the amount and cost of those services. And that's certainly, certainly true, but as your lawyers, to us, that's not the only purpose of the vendor contract. To us, what we're looking for is how the, the contract can protect the company if something would go wrong in terms of what services the, the vendor is providing. If there's a, a failure to comply with the contract's terms, if there's a failure to meet performance standards, turnaround times, et cetera, uh, all those little things that can happen. Essentially, what we look for is the type of remedies that you may have in the event anything goes wrong. And those are the kinds of provisions that we are really concentrating on. In that context, really the small print matters a lot. So it's our job to help you review it and to hopefully catch potential problems in a contract before anything bad ever happens. And to consider how, if something does go wrong, what you need to do to resolve that. And so in, result, in reviewing the small print and trying to figure out how best to protect the company, one thing you need to remember is that because the vendor is providing the contract, in many cases it may actually favor the vendor. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's a bad contract or that the vendor is trying to take advantage of the company with which it's contracting. Um, we certainly represent employee benefit vendors who have very fair and reasonable contracts that they use. So I'm not saying anything is necessarily a problem. But by virtue of the fact that the vendor has prepared the contract, it may simply just tend to be more favorable to the vendor. And, and that would work the same way if the company prepared the contract. Certainly we would help you draft a contract that would tend to favor you. So that is something that you do need to consider when you're reviewing a contract, and it's another reason why you don't necessarily want to just sign it as is. Um, in many cases, because you know that, that gives you another reason to consider negotiating some of the terms with the vendor so that you can get the best deal possible and that overall the contract represents the best deal possible for both sides of the arrangement, you and the vendor that you're using. Uh, certainly that helps to ensure that the overall relationship will be a win-win one. And ultimately, if you and your vendor are working more as a team, that benefits you and your employees much more than if you were just at odds. The second reason why it, it matters to have a review is that when we look at your contracts, what we want to do is try to future-proof the agreement. And you see that's in quotes. Um, what I mean by future-proof the agreement is to try to think of things that might change about your business in the future and how those changes could affect uh, the relationship with the vendor and how the contract really works. So, for example, what happens if the number of employees that you have grow substantially? How do the fees change under the agreement in that case? Do you get a per head increase? Uh, is there a certain plateau that you have to meet the number of employees before a a kick, a kick in comes with the, the cost to the, um, to the contract, things along that line. Uh, and on the other hand, what if you close division and your headcount drops substantially? Is there anything that occurs then to lower the fees that the vendor is going to be requesting of you? Uh, issues like that are the things that we are trying to help you consider when you're structuring your agreement with your vendor. Uh, and then a final reason why it may matter is as Greg mentioned, you know, a lot of times you're contracting with respect to vendors for ERISA 
plans. So in that sense, as the plan sponsor, you're going to have special responsibilities as the plan sponsor and a fiduciary of the plan. Uh, according to the Department of Labor, hiring a service provider for an employee benefit plan is a fiduciary function. So you need to ensure that your vendors are, first of all, carefully selected. And in addition, you've got a, responsible, a responsibility to your plan participants to ensure that you're only paying reasonable compensation for the services that your vendors do provide. And part of that means to make sure that you're getting um, all the services that you've agreed to from the vendor. All right, next, what can go wrong? Uh, there are a number of things that we tend to look for when we're reviewing contracts. And these are the, the places that we often see issues, potential problems could arise from, and you know, various uh, concerns that we may have. One of those is we look at the scope and the cost of services that are provider or to be provided. We want to know exactly what the vendor will do for you and it, how much it will cost and how that's described in the contract. We want to make sure that that's described the way that you've intended it to be described. Um, for instance, in, in a TPA contract that we recently reviewed for a client, the client had intended that the TPA would provide claims review services and would take care of really everything that was needed to be done there. However, the, the agreement that the TPA provided didn't actually specify that the TPA would be the claims review agent. And so it wasn't clear how that was actually going to happen and who would actually have the final say over any reviews, the TPA or the client. And while that issue might not be a problem when the relationship is running smoothly, the concern is that what if there's an issue down the line and a question arose about the claims process? Not knowing who has final responsibility or who's really in charge of the review could have been a problem for the client and for the vendor. Um, and one thing to keep in mind, although we look to see what the scope of the services are being provided and what the cost of those services may be, we're not the business people. So we're not really doing a review of what the actual deal between you and your vendors are. Um, rather, we're trying to figure out whether or not all the costs that you may have agreed to are being accrued in the manner that you think uh, that they are. So in the same contract that I just mentioned, um, that contract didn't really make clear how the costs that the client and the vendor had agreed to would be charged to the client, um, whether they would be charged on a per-person or a per-occurrence basis. I think both parties knew what they'd agreed to, which was a per-person charge, but it wasn't specified in the agreement. So that could have been a problem for the client had, for any reason, the relationship with the vendor soured. Uh, another thing to consider within the scope and cost of services is whether there are any performance standards that need to be incorporated into the agreement, such as turnaround times for claims processing, any requirements with ERISA or state laws that might need to be met. Uh, if, if there are those sorts of things, certainly the contract should address them, whether directly into the contract or incorporated by reference through addenda or appendices. Uh, next, we look at indemnification provisions. And these are the sorts of provisions that in a contract may often favor the vendor. For instance, you may have a, a contract that requires a fairly high level of liability before the vendor will be required to reimburse you for any mistakes. So we might see gross negligence or willful negligence as the indemnification triggers in an agreement. And those are really pretty high levels of, of failures. So you don't know exactly what that would involve, whether they're intentional failures, particularly egregious mistakes, et cetera. Um, and it would be difficult to, to find an error that would rise to that level of, of liability. So those are the types of indemnification provisions that you're going to want to look at and see if you can't negotiate for a more moderate level of liability. Ownership of member information, data, intellectual property. If there's any case under the contract where um, that kind of information is being used, you just need to specify exactly which party owns the right to that information or data and exactly how it will be used so that there's no, no concerns with that. And that's sort of outside and in addition to any issues that you might have in terms of confidentiality, uh, protected health information under HIPAA, and that sort of that sort of issue. 
Another thing that we often see come up in agreements is provisions addressing the fiduciary status of the vendor. There may be instances where the client assumes that the vendor will act as a fiduciary, but the agreement doesn't specifically provide for that or may even disclaim any obligation to act as a fiduciary. One of our attorneys, in fact, just recently reviewed a contract under which the vendor uh, was supposed to review claims and appeals for the client's medical plan, and the client had always intended that the vendor would act as a claims fiduciary for the plan. However, when the agreement came back from the vendor, it specifically said that no, there was no obligation to act as a fiduciary. So negotiation took place, and eventually the, the vendor did agree to take on that responsibility, but only at a very, very steep price because it was something that the client had to have. Um, contract term and automatic renewal provisions are another issue that we often look at and have concerns with. Um, you need to consider initially what the initial term of the vendor contract will be and whether it's appropriate. Uh, and to order to be at a, a reasonable contract under ERISA, an agreement must permit some sort of termination by the plan without penalty and on a reasonably short notice under the circumstances. And that's to prevent the plan from being locked into a contract that might in the future become disadvantageous to the plan. So you need to consider what your initial term will be and whether you can break the contract for certain reasons. Um, automatic term renewal provisions, these are not necessarily a problem, but again, you want to make sure that there's a reasonable mechanism by which you can cancel the, the contract before it will automatically renew, either because you just want to terminate the, the contract altogether or maybe you want to renegotiate the terms with the, the vendor. And finally, what we look for is what happens when the contract terminates. First, you need to know what circumstances will the contract be, or under which will the contract be terminated prior to the end of the term, and that's whether by you or by your vendor and what your rights are in the event that it does terminate before the end of the term. Are there any penalties for early termination for you or for the vendor again? Uh, and does the contract allow for correction of minor breaches of the agreement by either party? And what sort of time frame is there to correct those problems? Uh, in certain instances, time may be of an essence if you've got turnaround times for claims review and so forth that need to be met. Another thing to think about in terms of contract termination is what about transitional services? Will the vendor continue to provide services for some period of time while your new vendor is ramping up? And in that case, what fees will be charged? Uh, are the current fees what will be charged, or will there need to be some negotiation over the fees? And in that sense, there could be problems, because if you have to negotiate fees in a hurry to ensure that you've got services while your new vendor is coming online, you might end up paying more than you had hoped to. So that's something you certainly want to consider. Then the final point, how can you avoid contract problems? And how can you avoid having to deal with us bringing these things up at the end of the, the process, essentially? Um, in that case, really, preparation is key. It, it's important that you know exactly what you want before you even begin negotiations. Uh, in addition to selecting a good vendor, once you know what you need, it'll be easier for you to communicate that to your prospective vendors. And one potential way of doing this, as Greg mentioned, was to send out an RFP that specifically describes the services and products that you need from the vendor. Um, for instance, you might, if you, if you need to have fiduciary services or fiduciary responsibility on the part of the vendor, you want to necessarily mention that in the RFP so that the vendors will know up front that it's required. You might also consider including specific indemnification language that you'd be willing to agree to right in the RFP. That way, again, vendors know what they're getting into when they're looking at whether or not they want to apply for the, with the RFP. Um, and although preparing an RFP request and then reviewing any RFP submissions that you get can be time-consuming, if you go this route, then you certainly want to make sure that you make the time because Preparing a thorough RFP and taking the time to review the submissions will help you in ultimately selecting your, your vendor. And it's going to be much easier and probably ultimately much cheaper to iron out any potential conflicts that might occur before you get to the point of having your attorneys looking at the vendor's contract. One other consideration in that is that you might also request sample contracts from 
prospective vendors, and then you can see how they've structured those agreements from the get-go and whether you can agree to their terms or not. In addition to knowing what you need and what you want, you also need to know what your deal breakers are, what's important to you. Uh, certainly this is a contract negotiation, and while you want to get the best deal you can, you also want to secure a vendor that you can trust and that you feel you've ha you have a good working relationship with so that you can rely on the vendor to provide the services that you and your employees need ahead of time. So to do that, you really know, need to know what your deal breakers are, and then when you're in the heat of negotiations, you know what you can give up and what you really can't live without in terms of the contract. Finally, know when to walk away. And I was going to bring in a joke about know when to fold them, but I, I won't do that to you. Um, but it's important that you know that in some instances it may be better for you after you've tr reviewed a contract and tried to negotiate in good faith with the vendor to simply walk away rather than enter into a contract that really provides you with few few options. Um, and that's important when you're, if you think about doing that, you also want to make sure you've given yourself enough time when starting the whole process so that you're not backed into a corner again and need to sign something that may not be favorable to you just to get something into place. Or you may want to think about having a backup vendor in the case that things don't work out with your originally selected vendor. And in conclusion, I guess, um, hopefully this discussion will have provided you with a bit of insight about the things that we do look for as lawyers when we review your benefits contracts and your vendor contracts and why we think they're important. Uh, ultimately, when we review your, your contracts, we want to make sure that you're getting what you've agreed to with the vendor and that you're protected in case anything goes wrong in the future. Um, even though it's the last step in the process, Still, I think this, this sort of review does have an important part to play in protecting your rights and your, um, your business. And, but, you know, by selecting good vendors, figuring out what you need from the vendor in advance and knowing what's really important to you, you can also help minimize any potential contract issues that might arise and then get working with your, your vendor as soon as possible. And with that, I'm going to introduce Isaac Morris, who is an associate in our Milwaukee office, and as Greg mentioned, is going to present a, a program on qualified retirement and 401k plans, that pesky definition of compensation. Isaac? Thanks, Belinda. So as Greg mentioned earlier, for the next few minutes, I'm going to be talking about compensation in the context of 401k plans, uh, for the most part, but certainly this discussion also applies to other qualified plans as well. And I'm going to start out talking about compensation are discussing why the definition of compensation is so important, followed by some general concepts about that definition, including some uh, quote-unquote IRS-approved definitions. And then I'm going to end with a list of traps to watch, out, to watch out for, as well as some helpful hints that we think you can take to avoid having compensation errors. So what does make compensation so important? Well, there, there are a whole host of reasons. I've decided to just focus on three primary reasons that compensation deserves so much attention. And the first is that it often determines the amount of participant and company contributions under the plan. Hopefully I have everyone's attention here. I imagine most people are involved in uh, some type of retirement plan, if not a 401k plan, and you always want to know the benefit that you're receiving. And uh, for instance, maybe this sounds familiar, that your plan allows you to defer up to 70% of your compensation, and then maybe the plan offers a company match of 50% of the first 6% of your compensation. So right there, in order for you to know the amount, the, uh, the dollar amount of the benefit that you're receiving under the plan, you need to know how compensation is defined. Uh, theoretically, a plan could always require participants to make their deferrals in terms of flat dollar amounts. We usually don't see that. Um, the preferred approach seems to be the percentage of compensation method. And one of the benefits to using that method is that it automatically accommodates both increases and decreases in someone's pay. Another reason that compensation is so important is because the Internal Revenue Code uses it to apply, that uses the definition of compensation to apply benefit and deduction limits. 
And I'm not, not going to overload you with any code sections, but I do want to uh, mention one example here, and that is the limit on aggregate contributions or the limit on annual additions. Maybe you've heard of both of those, or, or maybe you've heard of that limit before. Um, as those names imply, this is a limit on the total contributions, both participant and company contributions, that a participant can receive uh, in one year from one or more qualified plans from the company. And for example, uh, or uh, sorry, importantly, uh, that limit is the lesser of a dollar amount or a percentage of compensation. And for example, for uh, 2012, the limit happens to be the lesser of $50,000 or 100% of compensation. Now, um, it, it may be that many of your employees may never even come close to reaching that threshold. Uh, I hope to someday, but again, uh, I'm not reaching that threshold. But you want to be careful because violating that, th that limit can threaten your plan's qualified tax status. And correcting uh, mistakes, especially if the IRS is the one who catches those mistakes, can be very expensive and time-consuming. So again, another reason to pay attention to the definition of compensation. And the last primary point here is because it is that the definition of compensation identifies highly paid individuals who cannot receive excessive or discriminatory benefits. And I just want to review this point briefly, but in a nutshell, there are a whole host of very technical rules that qualified plans must follow and that are designed to ensure that highly paid participants do not receive excessive or disproportionate benefits when compared to the, the non-highly compensated employees or the more rank-and-file folks. And now, as, as you may have guessed, determining who is and who is not highly compensated is, unsurprisingly, dependent on the definition or is dependent on compensation. And moreover, these, these discrimination rules are highly dependent on how compensation is defined. Uh, so much so, in fact, that a plan uh, may be able to avoid certain, uh, discri uh, certain discrimination testing requirements if certain definitions of compensation are used. So what makes defining compensation so pesky? Again, just for these next two slides, I want to review some of the uh, – or highlight some of the reasons that this is so. And the first one is, is that plans often use different definitions of compensation for different purposes. So uh, in my slides earlier, I referred to the limit on annual additions and the prohibition against discrimination. Again, the definition of compensation plays an important role in both of those. But you may also have a definition of compensation to match the needs and preferences of the employer. Uh, for instance, an employer may only want to provide a matching contribution on certain types of bonuses, and I'll refer to that again later. And while uh, theoretically a plan can always decide to use one definition of compensation for all purposes, and while that certainly could help from an administrative standpoint, it often doesn't work for other reasons. And again, employers may decide that certain uh, pieces of compensation, such as certain bonuses, shouldn't be included in the matching contribution. Uh, they could do that for a variety of reasons. Uh, it could be that providing a match on a, on a big bonus makes it too expensive for the company, and the company feels like the employee already received her bonus, she already got what, what was coming to her, we're not going to double up on that benefit. In addition, you can run the risk of discrimination if uh, paying a match or a profit-sharing contribution on that bonus is, um, uh, if those bonuses are only paid to highly paid individuals. So again, a lot of different reasons to define compensation and several ways that um, that definition can be pesky. But even if you only use one definition, and that sometimes happens, you're still not out of the woods because you still have to identify which elements of compensation you're going to use and then make sure that they're put into operation properly. 
and it can be difficult to say the least to make sure only the, the correct elements are chosen. I'm going to return to my theme of using bonuses here. And it's not uncommon for an employer to have many different kinds of bonuses, such as annual bonuses, quarterly bonuses, spot bonuses, holiday bonuses, and a whole host of others. And again, the employer may only want to provide a matching contribution, for example, to the annual bonus. So that needs to be understood by all parties who are helping to administer the plan, and then it needs to be implemented correctly as well. And this may sound familiar to you. Payroll systems often have dozens, if not hundreds, of pay codes. In fact, you're probably lucky if you only have a few dozen uh, pay codes. So again, it can be difficult, to say the least, to make sure that only the correct elements are chosen and then used in operation. So I just want to switch gears here for the next two slides for the next few minutes and talk about defining compensation in a non-discriminatory fashion. And the definition that I'm referring to here is, uh, for the most part, is the definition that is used to determine both company and employee contributions. So as I made reference to earlier, if a plan uses a quote-unquote approved or uh, a safe harbor definition of compensation, um, it's able to uh, 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 get a better uh, it's able to have the opportunity to avoid a certain discrimination testing requirements. And so in other words, while you don't have to use one of these safe harbor definitions of compensation, if you don't, the rules basically make you jump through some additional hoops to prove that you are doing everything correctly, you're, that you're doing everything right. And so I've listed the four common safe harbor definitions here. I'm not going to delve into any of them in any great detail, but I, want, I wanted to list them so that you would be familiar kind of with uh, some of the more common names they go by and just to have a general understanding of some of the quirks that take place. Uh, for instance, the, the default definition or the long list definition doesn't include everything under the sun, but it comes pretty close. So it includes obvious items such as salary and bonuses, as well as some less obvious items such as non-deductible moving expenses and taxable long-term disability benefits. Uh, the short list definition is somewhat of a, uh, um, a misnomer because it's, it's really not that short and it includes many items that you find in the long list as well. Uh, the federal wage withholding is also similar to the first two, and I'm going to come back and make a comment about that later. But the one I want to focus on the most here is the safe harbor definition uh, known as W-2 wages. And admittedly, using W-2 income sounds like a nice choice for administration purposes. It's already being implemented to figure out someone's taxes. It shows up on someone's W-2. So, you know, let's kill two birds with one stone and, and use the definition for the plan. And while that's not necessarily a problem, you do want to be aware of some of the quirks that take place with that definition. The biggest one is that W-2 wages includes imputed income. And imputed income is income which is usually not seen as cash, but it's still a taxable benefit to the employee. So the biggest example that I can think of here is income that is recognized on employer-paid group term life insurance. And so as you can imagine, there are a couple of issues that come up with imputed income. The first of which is employers may not be that crazy about offering a matching contribution or a profit-sharing contribution on imputed income. Sometimes the imputed income is just viewed as a quirky uh, internal revenue code rule or you know some special IRS thing, and we really don't want to provide uh, a benefit on that. The other difficulty with imputed income is that it's not cash compensation. So any employee contribution, uh, any employee contributions that are based on such income have to be taken from other sources. Now that may not be a problem, but again, you want to make sure you're aware of that so when it does happen that there are no surprises. I said I'd refer back to federal wage withholding earlier, and one of the interesting things about that is that it uh, excludes the taxable amounts from group term life insurance. 
So again, if one of these definitions does come up, you want to make sure you involve your attorney. Give us a call, and we can help you work through any questions that arise with them. But fortunately, you can still you can make some modifications and still stay within the safe harbor definition, still stay within the protection uh, of their umbrella. But you can only make certain modifications and still stay within the safe harbor definitions. One of the uh, changes that you can make is you can decide to either include or exclude all elective deferrals. And those deferrals encompass not only items such as participant deferrals under a 401k plan, but also deferrals made under a cafeteria plan. Another, ex another acceptable modification is to exclude any portion of compensation to some or all of the highly compensated employees. Uh, so, for instance, you could include annual bonuses for purposes of the more rank-and-file employees, the non-highly compensated folks, but exclude those bonuses for the highly compensated folks uh, when defining compensation. Now, if you want to make um, uh, too many modifications or if you want to make modifications that take you out of the safe harbor rules, or if you just don't want to use one of those definitions to begin with, maybe what you're trying to accomplish under the plan uh, your definition of compensation just won't fit with, with, within one of those safe harbors. That's not necessarily a problem. It's just that you then need to prov uh, comply with three general parameters, and that is that your definition of compensation has to be reasonable, it can't favor highly compensated employees, and it has to pass certain testing requirements. And as you can imagine, each of those has their own little subset of uh, requirements to deal with. So a lot of times, if it's at all possible, employers will try to fit within one of the safe harbors just for the benefits that they provide. So I'm going to move into the last phase here, and that is to talk about some common mistakes that we see as well as some helpful tips. The first mistake is, is more of a theme that, I, that, uh, that we see um, when discussing the issue of uh, the definition of compensation. And that is a failure to align the plan's definition of compensation with your expectations and operations. You want to make sure that the tail is not wagging the dog here. And what I mean by that is you want to find out what, what your preferences are, how you would like things to operate, and then make sure that those preferences are put into the plan's definition of compensation, if at all possible. Again, if you try to do it that way, Hopefully, you can keep things in alignment and, uh, and cause less problems. Another common mistake is to adopt a prototype plan without giving the, the, the necessary consideration to the definition of compensation. And we often see this when we often uh, see this arise uh, when someone will receive the adoption agreement for the prototype plan. And then there will be three or four definitions of compensation to choose from. You want to be careful before you just check one of those boxes without fully considering how compensation is defined. Those adoption agreements don't always go into the necessary detail that you need in order to understand the definition of compensation, especially if you're coming from an individually designed plan. So when you come across those situations, if you have questions, again, Make sure that you're talking to people. Make sure you're talking uh, to us, giving us a call and finding out, does this match what we've been doing already? Does this match how we, would, how we want things to operate? And then hopefully um, uh, by listening to this presentation, you've, you've uh, developed a, a better understanding of, of why the definition of compensation is important, even if, just a, even if it's just a little bit. In the, hopefully, uh, you, you never do incur errors, but if you do, you want to make sure that you take care of those mistakes quickly. Don't let them sit. Don't let them uh, accumulate and compound on one another. You certainly don't want uh, a participant coming to you and catching your mistake. And the last thing that you want is the service doing so. So when you find those errors, Take the necessary steps to get them fixed. It's almost always better to do it that way.
And that's a great segue to the most, uh, probably the most important tip on how you can avoid compensation errors. And that is to read your plan and your SPD and see what they say about compensation. And again, this is largely in the context of how uh, participants and company contributions are going to be determined. I am surprised by how often uh, this uh, reveals the, the, the problem rather than any of the other tips on here. Because oftentimes people will uh, spend years uh, making uh, matching contributions or profit sharing contributions that don't match with what the terms of the plan say. And that's not because anybody is trying to do anything improperly. It's not because people don't have good intentions. But for a variety of reasons, a disconnect occurs. So a regular review of your plan and your SPD compared with your operations can solve a lot of problems. Another thing that many of you are probably doing already is to make sure that you do an annual review of the plan's operations and, and, uh, and payroll definitions. You want to make sure that uh, contributions are not only being calculated correctly, but that you are complying with any other rules that are dependent on compensation. And maybe you have a third party helping you out with that annual review. A similar review is to spot check your plan. This could be any one of a number of, of informal uh, uh, checks against your plan. The, the, the most common one that I can think of is taking a few participants under your plan and trying to figure out what the amount of their participant deferral should be or figuring out what their matching contribution should be and then waiting until the next payroll cycle ends and seeing what that amount was and seeing if you have any discrepancies between the two. Again, it's a simple step, but if you do find something that doesn't match up, investigate it and see what's happening. Hopefully, if you amend your definition of compensation, you're paying attention to other things that it could affect. And this leads me into my last point, and that is if you change your definition of compensation, make sure that that information is passed on to all relevant parties. In fact, you always want the relevant parties talking to each other. You want the, those charged with administering the plan talking to the folks in HR, and you want those people talking to the appropriate people in payroll. And you want to have this this general conversation going on. That will help you to resolve a lot of issues up front before they ever occur. And it sounds a little cliche, but people work much better when they are focusing in a team setting like that rather than individual silos. So hopefully you now have a, a little bit better understanding of why compensation is important and, and pesky and some, and some things to watch out for. And with that, I'm going to turn things over to Greg. Thank you, Isaac. For our last topic today, we're going to revisit Section 409A. This is the most technical of the three presentations, but we'll do our best to translate those technical terms uh, and technical points into concepts. As mentioned in the introduction, we continue to see instances in which employers mistakenly believe that Section 409A can't possibly cover uh, a particular situation or that their program qualifies for an exemption from Section 409A. Today, what we want to do is review the core rules of when an arrangement is subject to 409A and a few practical illustrations of how or why Section 409A applies in certain situations. The starting point is to avoid jumping to conclusions based on labels. Although the term is non-qualified deferred compensation plan, there doesn't have to be a plan as we might generally think about it. Section 409A doesn't depend upon covering a group of employees. Rather, it can apply to a one-person arrangement. In fact, any arrangement is subject to Section 409A if it provides for a deferral of compensation. Now, that's a technical term, but what it, all it really means is that a plan or an arrange, or shall we say an arrangement provides for a deferral of compensation if the employee, number one, obtains a legally binding right during a taxable year to the payment of compensation, and number two, under the plan, the compensation is or may be payable in a later year. <clears throat> 
So what we have there is a legally binding right in one year and payment in a later year. We'll talk in a minute about exceptions and special rules, but this is the essence of Section 409A, legally binding right in one year, payment in a, in a later year. It doesn't have to be a formal plan as we think about that. It may be a one-participant employment contract, and that's, the, as a starting point, the reason why Section 409A is so broad, and that's why we continue to see instances in which employers think that, that Section 409A can't apply to their situation, but it does, because all Section 409A requires, we're going to get to the exception, but all it requires is a legally binding right in one year and payment in a later year. So with that, let's talk just for a couple of minutes about exceptions to Section 409A. Section 409A doesn't apply, or more technically, it's deemed not to, an arrangement is deemed not to provide for a deferral of compensation in several instances. First, your qualified retirement plans, your 401k plan or your defined benefit pension plan, those are exempt from Section 409A. Second, Something called Section 457B plans are also exempt from 409A. The emphasis here is on the B. A Section 457B plan is a deferred compensation plan that's maintained by a state or local government or a tax-exempt entity. So for private sector employers, a 457 plan isn't going to be relevant. But for tax-exempt or government employers, uh, a 457B plan, this, this thing also known as an eligible plan, is exempt from 409A. The key point here is that there's another type of 457 plan known as an F plan or an ineligible plan. We won't spend time on the details between these two plans, but there's another type of a plan which is, which is subject to 409A. That's the second exception. Third, certain welfare benefits are exempted from Section 409A. In particular, bona fide vacation leave, sick leave, compensatory time, disability pay, or death benefit plans are excluded from Section 409A coverage. Now, having said that, a couple of words of caution regarding what is and isn't in that list of exemptions. First, note that medical coverage is not included in that list of exemptions that I just read. There are separate rules in Section 409A regarding post-termination medical benefits. We won't go through those rules today, but the key point is that Section 409A is not limited to cash benefits. A contract that provides for post-termination medical benefits must be evaluated under Section 409A. Now, Section 409A provides a fair degree of flexibility to provide post-termination medical benefits, so I don't mean to imply that it's impossible to accomplish the goal. But even so, the point is that it is an issue that must be analyzed under 409A because 409A isn't limited to cash benefits. Also, note that that list of welfare benefits that I read uh, uh, regarding exclusions, uh, it, even though the, the, the benefits are excluded, there's a distinction that sometimes has to be made between the benefit and the obligation to pay for the benefit. Although the benefits under the, these programs might be excluded from Section 409A, an agreement obligating the employer to pay the premiums for certain coverage, for example, post-employment life insurance, may be subject to 409A. So the benefit and the arrangements for payment of the cost of that benefit might be two different things. This is often an example, uh, it, this is often an overlooked example, overlooked issue if an employer has a contract whereby the employer has agreed to pay the premium for post-retirement life insurance, for example, or post-termination life insurance, the premium payments, the employer's obligation to make those premium payments has to be analyzed under 409A, and that can be particularly relevant if it's a publicly traded uh, corporation. So the point here is that although there, there's welfare benefits which are excluded from 409A coverage, don't jump to the conclusion that that necessarily exempts the entire relationship surrounding those welfare benefits. The contractual terms and conditions whereby one party agrees to pay for those, those benefits may well raise 409A issues, and we see employers who get surprised by that. 
The fourth exception or exemption from 409A coverage that we want to mention today is something known as the short-term deferral rule. This is a very important but sometimes misunderstood exception. And what we're talking about here is that if an arrangement requires that payment be made within a two-and-a-half-month period following the date on which the employee becomes vested in the benefits, then that arrangement is going to be exempt from Section 409A. Now, the actual regulation defines the short-term deferral rule in a little bit more complex fashion, but generally speaking, this two-and-a-half-month period ends on March 15th of the calendar year following the year in which the employee's right to receive the compensation is no longer subject to a substantial risk of forfeiture, that is, when the employee becomes vested. So in essence, if amounts are required to be paid by March 15th of the year following the year of vesting, the arrangement's exempt from Section 409A. And when we refer to vesting or this concept that the employee has to have a substantial risk of forfeiture, what we're most typically talking about is a requirement that the employee perform future services. You know, in other words, that the employee is going to forfeit that award if employment terminates prior to that prescribed vesting date. Or we're talking about a financial term and condition whereby an award is payable. It's only earned if the financial performance of the organization meets certain targets that are established in advance. If those targets aren't met, well, then that's a risk of forfeiture. The employee isn't vested. Now, this explains why some common payments are outside the scope of 409A. For example, payment of regular salary and the provision of regular employee benefit coverage during active employment is exempt from 409A because the employee has to be employed during that period in order to receive the benefits for that period. And the payment of those benefits, your payment of your normal base salary, the provision of your medical insurance for that payroll period, it's either made contemporaneously or shortly after the period. Similarly, an annual bonus that is paid by March 15th of the following year is going to be exempt from 409A because the employee has made an election, is going to be exempt from 409A unless the employee has made an election to defer the receipt of the bonus. So regular salary is exempt. The normal ongoing benefits that an employee has are exempt. And so that raises the question, so what are these trouble spots that we're seeing? Well, two that we'll mention today are, number one, executive incentive arrangements and subsequent modifications thereto, and two, a misunderstanding or misapplication of the short-term deferral rule. Now, on executive incentive arrangements, we talked about this a little bit during our July 2011 discussion, and it goes back to the point that is noted earlier in this discussion, Section 409A is not limited to plans covering groups of employees. A one-participant arrangement might be a deferred compensation plan for purposes of 409A, and as a result, employment contracts or executive incentive programs must be reviewed for Section 409A compliance. Further, to reinforce a couple of other points being made earlier, don't be fooled by the terminology. As we talked about, as we just talked about, it doesn't have to be something that's labeled a deferred compensation plan. 409A can cover the bonus or incentive plan. So what we get down to, if we boil all of this down, what we get down to is that if an amount or benefit is credited to an employee in one year, the employee is vested in that amount. In other words, there's not this risk of forfeiture. And the arrangement provides for payment beyond March 15th of that second year or of the year after it's earned, then Section 409A applies unless you can identify a specific exception. This doesn't mean that Section 409A has been violated, but it does mean that Section 409A applies. And if Section 409A applies, the practical reality is it means that it's more difficult to make future changes in the arrangement. If an arrangement is exempt from Section 409A, there's greater, not unlimited, but greater flexibility to make future changes in the arrangement. But if that arrangement is subject to 409A, 
future changes in the agreement, and in particular changes in the time and the form of the payment, are more difficult to make. Now, this is a critical point. We continue to see examples in which parties want to change a prior agreement without even realizing that it's subject to Section 409A. The practical reality is that the managers of the business frequently discuss the formation and modification of these arrangements. It happens all of the time. The legal reality is that post-service changes, you know, changes made after the fact, may raise Section 409A considerations. As an example of this, uh, if an employer negotiates an arrangement with a key employee to provide incentive uh, compensation opportunity based on an uh, objectively defined growth and a key business metric over a three-year period, the employment contract, not some formal plan, just the employment contract, but nevertheless subject to 409A, provides for partial payments in year four and the remainder to be paid in installments after the executor's retirement, which the parties expect to occur at the end of the three-year period. The initial three-year period's a success. The executive doesn't want to retire. The parties want to continue the incentive arrangement with certain modifications. They produce a new employment contract that provides incentive opportunities in years four, five, and six. And then they also want to rearrange the payment terms to move some of the amounts that were to be paid in installments following the expected retirement into years five and six to cover expected college education costs problem is that that modification violates 409A. The original agreement providing for payments after retirement is subject to Section 409A. The executive was vested in the payment amounts. The arrangement provided for payments beyond March 15th of the year following the year in which the employee became vested. And changing that payment term is an acceleration of the benefit, and Section 409A doesn't allow that. Now, I just want to spend a couple of minutes to, uh, going at a high level through the last few slides, which is that the second area that we see difficulty with is misapplication of the short-term deferral rule. In other words, thinking that there's an exemption from 409A that applies when it does not. Uh, and, and in particular, where we see this come up from time to time is in uh, long-term or multi-year bonus programs. Many employers believe that their long-term multi-year uh, incentive program is a short-term deferral exempt from Section 409A. And many, in fact, are exempt on that rule. However, not all are exempt. And, if we, and the way to look at that is if we uh, go back to our two risk of forfeitures uh, that we generally talked about, a requirement to perform future service or a requirement that certain financial net metrics be met. Uh, in many cases, one or both of those two rules will be met, but in not, not in all cases. And the reason that you, with respect to the requirement to perform substantial services, there generally is a rule that says an employee has to be employed for the entire period in order to be eligible for the, the three-year payout. Uh, however, there's usually also an exception to that rule. And the exception might say that if the employee is eligible for retirement, well, then they can terminate during the period, and they can still get a payout, either a full payout or a prorated payout. And what that means is that, at least for some of the employees, there isn't a substantial risk of forfeiture during the entire period. The employee can quit during the period, and they'll still be entitled to a payout, and, and that payout isn't made by the following March 15th. It's going to be made at the end of the three-year period. And so, therefore, the short-term deferral rule, rule may not apply with respect to that service condition. Same type of situation with respect to the performance metrics. In many cases, in fact, most cases, the performance metrics constitute a risk of forfeiture because the individual, uh, because the, uh, you, you, you don't know whether the, whether the conditions have been met until you get to the very end of the period. But we see some situations in which that's not really the case. We see situations in which the payout in year four is really uh, not a result, not a single calculation, but it's a calculation of separate amounts for years one, years two, and years three, so that year one 
is really fixed at the end of year one. And so you have an amount that's fixed at the end of year one, and it's not payable until year four. And for that person, the performance can, criteria, again, doesn't satisfy the short-term deferral condition. Now, it, just to, to wrap up here, uh, where that's relevant is that if you don't satisfy the short-term deferral condition, it's not necessarily a disaster. But if you don't, if you don't satisfy the rule, what it may mean is it may impact your ability to make subsequent changes in the arrangement because it's more difficult to make changes if you're subject to 409A than if you're exempt. And it also may be important in determining when and how an employee can make an election to defer payment of the award. The, the, the timing by which the employee is allowed to make that election may vary based upon whether you're subject to 409A or whether you're exempt from 409A. And so that, that's, that's an everyday issue that is catching employers by surprise. So, it, it's, so what, we, what you need to do is, in terms of summary and just wrapping up, really what you need to do is, is number one, don't get caught by, by labels. Uh, be on the lookout for employment contracts uh, and uh, one-off benefit arrangements. And number two, take a look at your long-term bonus plans and make certain that if you're relying on the short-term deferral rule, that you really, in fact, qualify for that rule. And and uh, and that's something that that we can obviously help with. Uh, that that obviously that that concludes our presentation for today. As a reminder, the remaining sessions of the 2012 Employee Benefits Broadcast uh, will be on April 24, 2011, July 24, 2011, and October 23, 2011. Thank you, as always, for joining us. Uh, a copy of the PowerPoint presentation and a multimedia recording will be available on our website within 24 to 48 hours. We always welcome your feedback. Uh, if you can, please take a few moments before you leave the web conference today to provide us with your feedback, and thanks again. Ladies and gentlemen, that does conclude today's conference. You may all disconnect and have a wonderful day.